So my congratulations, Professor Schambau. I think it was an excellent presentation, a very comprehensive one. You showed us a film, with a film with plenty of colors, with a very good script. And I don't have a film to present. I just have one picture. It is the colors perhaps are similar with some difference in shades. But I would like to say that the Brazilian China Brazil Business Council is very proud of uh, co sponsor this, this meeting. And uh, I would make uh, only a few comments because you covered most of the issues concerning the challenges for the new leadership. And these comments will, will base, be based on two experiences. One is uh, I've been the, the chairman of the, the China Brazil Business Council for two years. And I have been working considerably in trying to understand who is your, our most important partner. Because China is the first uh, trade partner of Brazil and the first investor of Brazil now. And we think sometimes that we don't know very well how to negotiate with China because we don't understand it quite well. So we have been doing uh, some thinking. We have been doing some investigations on, on Chinese investments in Brazil. And this is part of our experience that I will share with you. And there is a very specific experience, a very recent one, which is that I was invited to a seminar which was organized uh, in uh, Beijing uh, about uh, three weeks ago, which was exactly on this subject. What are the challenges facing the new leadership? This was organized by the Chinese government, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, by a, a group of think tanks and the Chinese agencies, uh, the Academy of Science, the China Institute for International Relations, and it counted with the participation of 25 Chinese uh, and 25 uh, guests from abroad. I was one of them. And it was a very unusual seminar, I have to tell you, because it was a closed seminar, but it was an open discussion. And I was very surprised to see some of the issues which uh, were raised, for instance, by uh, one lady from South Africa, which leads a very important human rights uh, NGO. And she was very upset because this NGO invited uh, Dalai Lama to China, and the Chinese government didn't want to allow, to give him a visa to, to make so to South Africa. To South Africa under the pressure of the Chinese government. And uh, this lady was very upset, and uh, she talked about a, a very, very unjustified uh, action by the South African government under the pressure of the Chinese government. And uh, she made a lot of criticism. And the answer by one of the Chinese participants was a very simple and very interesting answer. And he said, you know, um, the Chinese government is very unhappy when you talk about Dalai Lama. It's <laughs> 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 a, very, a very interesting, very simple answer. Now, um, what I would like to, to discuss or to, to share with you are five basic issues or five basic question marks which normally are raised when we talk about China today. And the first one, which is very important for Brazil and for Latin America, is, is the growth in China sustainable? At a time when China is going through a very difficult, though important, transition, at a time when the import markets for China are slowing down or in a depression, uh, will the new leadership be able to, f to face some daunting reforms? The second question is uh, perhaps a question which is more important for us and for the academy rather than for the Chinese, which is, is the expansion, expansion and the growth of the economy in China compatible with a closed political system? I say for, for, for the West, 
this is a very relevant question because we have been educated under the assumption that there are two models, or there were two models in the world, antagonic, different, not compatible. And the, China, the Chinese don't raise this issue. <coughs> I was, uh, during a time, the representative of Brazil before the OECD, and attended a discussion on China science and technolo technology program. It's a peer review. All the ambassadors that wanted participated, and was a delegation of 15 people from China. And they really didn't care whether the policy was a, had a capitalist approach or a socialist, socialist approach. They solved the issue with a simple phrase again, which is uh, China has a socialism with Chinese characteristics, period. It's like the answer on, on human rights. But for, from our point of view, there is a, a, a incompatibility. I think the Chinese don't agree with that. And they showed that it's possible to grow despite a centralized and political closed economy. The third question is, uh, will the Chinese, the new leadership, be able to face the social challenges? Because they are fully aware that uh, many people, many regions are not happy. And China faces an inequality which is unprecedented in China. China had poverty, had misery, but not this, kind, this degree of inequality. The fourth item is, will the new leadership be able to face the demands for freedom and for more participation in the political system? And uh, finally, and perhaps what they were more concerned in this seminar, in which they wanted to pass a message, but at the same time to listen to some people on how China was perceived abroad on some specific issue, is what is the role for China in a new multipolar world. Uh, with respect to, to the economy, with the first point, I'd like to, 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 re to remind of uh, the very interesting presentation which was made by Minister Liu He, which is the Vice Chairman of the National Development and Reform Commission, which, as you know, is a central agency in China. And what I was surprised is the insistence the Chinese leaders had during the whole sem two-day two seminar in insistence in recognizing the need for reform. I thought this was a lip service for some foreigners who wanted to listen to that. But I have some doubts, because they focus on very specific issues. The issue, the, the, the challenge of migration, of inflation and rising costs, the challenge of the reduction of foreign demand, poverty and inequality, pollution, in which China set up a target which is quite uh, courageous, which is a reduction of uh, CO2 emissions by 25% till 2020, the age of labor force and so on. So the impression I had by this insistent in reiterating this, the need for these reforms, is that because the, it is perhaps because they are aware of that. And they are aware that in order to reach their goal of being a superpower, which is a very determined position by the Chinese leaders, they'll have to reform the economy. They have no doubt that China will be at least one of the two big powers. I, when I was the, the, the spokesman for President Cardozo, I used to attend some of the meetings he had with the foreign president and prime minister who visited Brazil. And I attended the meeting he had with Yang Semin. It is the most impressive meeting I have ever attended to. Because Yang Semin spoke as if he had no doubt that China would become a big superpower of the 21st century. Despite the efforts by the United States to prevent this from happening. So I've never seen that. And I think this conviction is shared 
by the Chinese leadership, and I would even say by Chinese society. What is also very interesting is that uh, a week ago, uh, Li Keqiang, whom you mentioned, was the prime minister, had a meeting with some Chinese leaders, and they set up an agenda for change. And within the items which are in this agenda are capital account liberalization. And you know how difficult this will be for China to accomplish. It's the key reform change. Reform of the Juku, I don't know how to pronounce it, the Juku system, which is authorized residence. Nobody can come to the countryside, to the, vill vill to the cities, and have the possibility of renting or buying a house if it has a, doesn't have a previous authorization. So this is on the table, at least. Whether they are going to do it or not, I don't know for sure. But the insistence they have in stressing the need for such reforms is something that we have to look at. Another issue of reform, to control the I local indebtedness. And we know this is a big distortion of the Chinese economy, and as you mentioned, reduction of red tape. Now, as to the social challenges, there's a big insistence on building a safety net, which the Chinese don't have, to expand domestic consumption and uh, to ensure better living conditions. The question is not whether they should do or whether they are going to do. It's how to do it in a huge country and with such a big diversity. Now, the discussion is different as to the political system. If on the economy, the discussion or the proposal are very assertive with respect to the political system, they are more cautious and contained. The CCP, the China Communist Party, is the sensitive core of a machine which implies the Chinese society and the Chinese state. There, where the selection of leaders takes place, that where the new ideas are produced or diffused, that's where the economy meets politics. And it's very interesting. I have a very limited chi experience, in experience on China compared this to you both. But uh, what uh, I found it very interesting is the people I met the, in the Chinese section of the Business Council who are leaders or CEOs or uh, chairman of Chinese big state-owned companies, they're all in the Communist Party. They have a, an important role, and that's where I think, and that's where I understand there is this kind of uh, communication between the economic and the political priorities. And they have a single source that is, is the party. Uh, that's the party is where the decision making, making process takes place. And uh, that's where change is more difficult. Perhaps they'll be more relaxed with some changes in the freedom of expression. It's impossible to control the social media. Uh, perhaps there'll be some uh, relaxation with respect to the participation in some peripheral agencies, but the core decisions, I think, will be taken always in the party. And the... Uh, the privation or the, uh, the threat to the party is a, is a threat, I think, to the whole Chinese project. China will never be a Western democracy. It will never be a consumption democracy, as well as the United States will never be a centralized economy. This is something of our times. I remember President Cardozo, we had together in a conference a few weeks ago, and he mentioned we have to understand and respect the difference because this is a feature of our world. Now, what I, I'll say two more words 
is on the political, uh, on the foreign policy. Perhaps it is a, a diplomatic bias, but I think this is very interesting. What China is doing and what is Chinese doctrine for foreign relations. And in this respect, I was very much impressed to listening to Tseng Bijan. Claude Wald had already told me that he has been a central piece in the design of uh, Chinese modern foreign policy. He was a contemporary of Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping asked him to, to present a paper on the basic ideas of foreign policy, and he has two or three very simple concepts again. One is the peaceable, peaceful rise or peaceful development of China. And he says in a very simple but smart way that we have first to deal with the, with the issues in which you have uh, a convergence uh, of perceptions, a community of interests. And later on, we'll deal with our differences. And I think that's what China is doing. For the, the economic emergence first, the political emergence later. And I think we are in a transition also with respect for this change. Uh, s according to the Chinese, this idea of uh, peaceful development is totally compatible with the present priorities. And uh, the BRICS play, from the point of view of China, a more important role than it plays for us or for our other breaking BRICS countries. The BRICS are a world network, a political network, to democratize decisions in the making, decision-making process uh, and the governance of the world. They will pave the way for China's emergence in our century, political emergence. Now, it's also very interesting how the Chinese perceive the relations with the United States according to this general vision of a peaceful development. What they say, we, ha we have to construe our convergences. We have to construe our community of interest, but we have to be prepared, even military, to a conflict in case it takes place. What I think is mo most interesting thing is uh, some comments I heard from, from Joseph Nye. We are in the, in the same council. And uh, he made a comment which I think is, is almost similar to that of the, China, or the Chinese. And Nye says, we have to engage with China, but at the same time, we have to make a hedge. That's what the Chinese say. And uh, I, I agree with you that perhaps competition with, between China and the United States is larger than it was before. But it, it, it's, it's, it's a peaceful competition. Up until now, you don't see any risk of evolving towards a military conflict. <coughs> perhaps it's a naive perception, but what I think is interesting is that it is a, a shared competition shared perception or a shared policy. But there are some other aspects in China which are more difficult to, to understand or to justify because they are inconsistent. What is the importance for China of the conflict in the South Sea Islands? Why, why this display of power by the Chinese, it's true that they were provoked by Japan, but even though the reaction doesn't have a proportion with the nature of the problem. Why to try to prohibit the visit of Dalai Lama to South Africa? This is something which is very difficult because they do not affect any strategic interest of China. Why, how can we understand the position by China vis-a-vis -vis Korea although it changed more recently. Korea damages effectively only one country, and that's China. Because the, the threat by Korea provides the legitimacy 
and the opportunity for a wider military presence of the United States in the Pacific. So why to try to calm Korea or to understand or to accept? But the real question for China emergency in the world, I think, it is the lack of uh, a vision. Whenever we had in history changes uh, of uh, dominant countries or changes in the balance of power, there was almost always a new set of ideas, a new set of values which provided the legitimacy for the new leader, for the new hegemon, for its hegemony. Now, the question we may answer at a time when the economic emergence of China seems to be inexorable, at a time when China starts to flex its muscles in the international organizations and setting up many partnerships in the world, will China be able to be a big power or to be part of a duopoly, which I think is the, the most likely scenario for the future, if it doesn't have a vision, if it doesn't have a story to tell to the world, which makes its emergency acceptable. Uh, I think this is a big problem, and China, I think, is aware of that. When uh, you mentioned the, the, the speech by, I think it's Xi Jinping, on the, the, uh, on the Chinese dream is the search for a story to tell. As I think, and uh, Claudio once mentioned that the Chinese are aware of this problem and they are <coughs> proliferating Confucius Institutes around the world. I think that's a, a positive step, but certainly it's not uh, sufficient. Now, I think we are clearly uh, assisting, to a certain extent participating in China transition, in economy, in social policies, in the politics and the presence in the world. They are not in a hurry because they think time is the in, on, in their favor. And they will possibly or s probably <coughs> occupy important positions, have a wider participation in economic institutions. This will come naturally, as it will come naturally, the yuan becoming a reserve currency. It is already a currency for trade. But in order for China to accomplish its dream, and I think the main dream is the leadership in the world, uh, it will have to take care of its vulnerabilities, which you mentioned and I think uh, which I also tried to, to point out. In a world which ha where, where there is no room for inconsistencies between what you do at home and what you do abroad, <coughs> and uh, in a world in which China has to tell more clearly wha why what it is emerging for. Thank you.